Welcome back to the GCN Tech Clinic. In this very video, we're going to be answering some of your tech related questions that you've been leaving under our videos using the hashtag AskGCNTech. So hopefully we can help you out and fix your problems. Fix all your problems. <laughs> Maybe not all of them. <laughs> no. Right. Um, first question is from Sir March. They say, after having a bike fit, I have the option of getting a bike with a slam stem, brackets, no spacers, but would have to fit a shorter stem or another bike with 100 millimeter stem that comes with using one centimeter of spacers, um, including like the headset bearing cover. Which of these two options would you recommend? Oh, there's a secondary question Ooh, here as well. Go on. Also, if you had to go 0.5 millimeters too long or 0.5 millimeters too short for the reach, which would you choose? Okay, so it sounds a complicated question. I think it's actually fairly simple. Would you choose a bike with no spacers under the stem or a bike that has some spacers under the stem? I would go with a little bit of spacer underneath, just so in the future, your body flexibility might change. You might want to come up a little bit. You might want to go down a little bit, get a bit more aggressive. And 0.5 millimeter, what? so, so tiny that you're not going to notice it. You can't even choose um, a stem or a handlebar reach that varies with such a minuscule no. amount. Um, Pro, which is a, a componentry brand of Shimano, and most brands only do like 10 millimeter increments, but Pro did do stem increments in one millimeter steps for the like sponsored teams. Mm. And if a Pro team only has one millimeter increments, I don't think we need to be worried about yeah. half a millimeter. Um, I completely agree with you though on what I would do. I think you'd be happy no matter what you choose anyway. Go for the bike. It's not much difference. Yeah, go for the bike that allows you to have the most scope for adjusting it in the future. Yeah. And that you like the best. <laughs> um, next question, who have we got? Oh, let me scroll. Next question is in from Jack. Hi everyone, I want to ask you about Zwift. Mm. I ride on maximum training difficulty. Oh boy! I ride on. <laughs> Least mean, training no. difficulty. Yeah. <laughs> but sometimes out of nowhere, the training difficulty feels like it's turned off. When I look at the settings, it's on max and can't do anything about it. It's annoying and some annoying sometimes, especially when I ride on hills. Have you ex ever experienced this kind of problem? What should I do about it? Thank you for everything. Hope you're having a nice day. <laughs> <laughs> the, the last bit's the best bit. It is. Have you got any initial thoughts on this? What um, kind of personally, I haven't had this problem. Yeah. And I would say it's probably maybe a connection problem. Yeah, I feel like I that's, I feel like that's right. You need to update Zwift. Have you done that recently? You might want to do that. Yeah, that, that's perfect advice. Check that Zwift is updated. Check that the firmware on whatever smart trainer you're using is updated. And then check that you're using like the most robust connection between your device and yeah. your trainer. So I would do it in the following order of priority. I'd use Wi-Fi over Bluetooth, and I would use Bluetooth over Ant Plus. And I feel like <clears> if <throat> there's any devices in the room that use oh, yeah. Wi-Fi or Bluetooth, maybe turn them off. They might be yeah, messing if your around laptop, a bit. If your laptop is also connected to like Bluetooth headphones, it's going to limit and interfere yeah. with stuff. There you go. That's really good advice, man. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. <laughs> um, <laughs> 10K Tube says, can the industry simplify power measurement to a shoe-based model? Is there a way to put pressure sensors into, say, the insole so that you don't have to deal with bike-to-bike -bike power meter changes? It'd be a hell of a lot cheaper and easier. Well, no, I, presumably it's complicated, otherwise somebody would have done it already. I feel like maybe in like 50 years we might see it when it's like... Why not 49? Maybe, <laughs> Maybe it's like, I feel like there could be, you know, a tiny little thing that you can put in your shoe that can measure your power, but we're probably quite a long way off that. I yeah. think if they were to do it at the minute, it would be, it would just wouldn't really work. I'm thinking along um, like some sort of more practical reasons for this. So say crank based power meters, you've got, in terms of all of the different options of cranks, you've got a handful of different crank lengths mm. and a few chainring sizes. Whereas if you look at shoes, you've got so many different colours, yes. models, you've got carbon soles, nylon soles, you've got like a plethora of sizes in between. You've got a wide fit. I just think it would be way, way, way too complicated. And um, a power meter is like a delicate measuring device. So you don't want to be like walking around on it, no. banging around on your shoes. It's not, not really cafe. accurate. Yeah. That's, that's my take on it anyway. Yeah. Who we got next? Um, one in from Michael. How many watts does a ticking <laughs> disc brake rotor actually take away? 
At least 100. Mm. I have Minimum. it like all the time where there's that little rub in on the disc and it's like I have to push <laughs> at least 100 extra watts. Oh, you are such a joker. I'm joking. Um, I'm joking. <laughs> on, I, don't, I think if it's just audible, I don't think you're even going to be able to measure yeah. it. Half a watt, maybe? It's more of an annoyance than anything that's actually slowing you down. Mm -hmm. um, pretty simple fix. Double check that the disc brake rotor isn't warped or bent. If it is, you can sort of tweak it back into place and make sure that the caliper is sat central on the rotor. There yeah. you go. Um, Millie next says, hey, you beautiful people. <laughs> Sounds like something Blake would say. It does. I recently made the jump to try new cycling shoes and pedals from trainers and flats but found uh, experienced numbness in different areas of my feet after a few minutes. The shoes weren't feeling overly tight, even tried them on the end of the day when their feet were swollen from walking around they've been doing. Um, they do have wider feet than average though, and the shoes they chose weren't specifically wide fit. Any thoughts? I think it is probably down to the shoes you chose, like saddles. There are loads of different saddles to choose from. Some you find really comfy, some you find very uncomfortable. It's the same with shoes. Some shoes I've had in the past have been like, you know, carbon shoes are really, really stiff. And after a few hours of riding, especially in the heat, your foot gets swollen. And I literally have to take my feet out of my pedals because I just can't pedal anymore because it's so uncomfortable. So I yeah. think it is going to come down to the shoe, which is a shame if you've just bought new shoes and they're not working out for you. But what can you do? Sell, you can sell them on second hand. Yeah. Someone will buy them and then go into a bike shop that I don't know if you've been to a bike shop or you bought online, but bike shops are usually the best place to go just because you can get advice from people working at the bike shop. They know their stuff. They can tell you if you have wide feet, this shoe is the best. You can try it on, have a feel for it, and go from there. That's mega solid advice. Yeah, I'm exactly the same to be honest. That's all I could suggest. Yeah. Um, right, on to our last question for this week. It's from Chris. They say, what is the best way to clean um, your bike on a winter commute so that the bike is actually usable and not causing damage to the drivetrain on the way home? Um, is there something quick where space and water is limited because it's making a mess and before they can clean the bike on their home? Well, I can give the advice of what I do, actually, on my commutes to work. Well, you just leave your bike inside, so it's fine for <laughs> you. It's literally just over there, indoors, um, drying off. But if you have to leave your bike outside, what I would suggest is if you have a sort of old cloth or rag, I would just wipe the chain over mm. just quickly. You don't have to wash your bike off or anything. And then that's going to get the worst of the sort of grime off of it. And um, it should just be good to go on the way home. It's just not the best situation. Yeah, scenario. I feel like if you're, you know, you're riding to work, your bike's got wet, it's cold, you leave your bike outside yeah. all day, it's not, it's just not going to dry, is it? Cause... It's not dry, it's not good for the bike, but probably the best thing you can do is a cloth, wipe the chain off, and maybe apply a fresh bit of chain lube to it. It's about as good as you can get. Yeah, there's not um, loads that you can do to make a world of difference when it comes to... If you do have somewhere to store it that's dry, then your bike's going to dry out throughout the day. Yeah. That's probably the best thing to do. Other than that, I can't think of any better solutions. Um, right, that's it for this week's GCN Tech. I hope that's answered your questions as best we could. As always, if we haven't got to your question, I apologise, but keep putting it in the comments section down below. And in the future weeks, well, hopefully we'll pick it out. Right, we're out of here. See you later. See ya.